what's this? Production values in my Foolish 50 reaction? It's more likely than you think. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. Last spring, I ranked my top 50 players in MLB going into the 2022 season. Now it's time to take a look back at them. Will I be held accountable for my crimes? Let's find out. I kicked off the 50 with Logan Webb, pitcher for the San Francisco Giants. This was a case where MLB Network didn't have him ranked in the top 100, and I decided to put him at 50 to try to show him who's boss, you know? I felt like Logan Webb had a chance to be one of the absolute top pitchers in the league this year, and I'd succeeded in a similar spot last year in 2021's list with Brandon Woodruff, so 50 kind of a clickbaity spot, an opportunity to use a player that MLB Network, once again, not even in their top 100. How did Logan Webb turn out? Overall, I'm feeling pretty good about this one. He had 4.2 Fangraphs wins above replacement in terms of my F4 guide right here. That puts him right on the cusp of top 50. So if he wanted to be a top 50 player by F4 this year, 4.2 was indeed the cutoff and Logan Webb got just there. Now I should say, don't take war that literally. You know, I know I'm the sabermetrics guy. I know I mentioned that stat a lot, but it, it maybe not down to the decimal point. It has a margin of error of about one going in either direction. As you can see, if you want to look more at the traditional stats, 192 innings pitched, 2.90 ERA. Hard to argue with that. Logan Webb succeeds because he gets a lot of soft contact. He pitches in the big ballpark. I think he's a really good player. I'll also be integrating some viewer feedback. This one is actually from the live stream, the live video premiere of the Foolish 57 months ago from Summoning Salt. Let's go! He's very excited to see Logan Webb. He is a known San Francisco Giants fan. Thank you, Summoning Salt. We are the Logan Webb bros. Coming in at number 49 was Houston's Alex Bregman. For me personally, this was what I would call a benefit of the doubt spot. We're talking about a player who I don't think was a top 50 player in 2021, but you also wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. So I slot him in this year at 49. And it'll be network much more confident in him. They had him at 29 coming into this year. That's kind of crazy to think about. How did Alex Bregman end up in 2022? Pretty good, actually, and if you go by the F4 guide, it looks like MLB Network did get the best of me here, although once again, there's a margin of error with that. Uh, interesting to note, you know, you're talking about a 366 on base percentage, 454 slugging, that adds up to an 820 OPS. You think, well, 820 OPS, that's pretty good, but actually, in the year 2022 with offense suppressed, that's really good. That adds up to a 133 OPS plus. That says he's 33% better than the league average hitter. And we combine that with plus eight outs above average at the third base position, playing the full season, 155 games, 5.5 F4. Excellent season for Mr. Alex Bregman. Number 48, Marcus Simeon. This is one of the picks I'm most proud of because when you think about it, Marcus Simeon had been an MVP finalist each of the last two seasons coming into this year. Full seasons, I should say. So 2019 and 2021. MVP finalist. He was incredible. I rank him 48. MLB Network ranks him 20. What made me so pessimistic about Marcus Simeon? Didn't like some of the StatCast data, especially in terms of him moving ballparks from Toronto to Texas. Thought it was going to be hard for him to get anywhere close to those home run totals he did in 2021. He had a solid enough season, and he really salvaged it after a really rough start. But in 724 plate appearances, which is, you know, league-leading volume, he had a 108 OPS+, plus, plus 8 outs above average at second base. It adds up to 4.2 F4, which again, you know, if we're being really, really literal about this guide, which we shouldn't, that's, that's right at the edge of 50. And so to have him ranked where I had him ranked versus, you know, sort of the industry consensus, right? This is actually a huge victory for me. I feel like I did a good job understanding who Marcus Simeon is as a ball player. I don't consider him to be like just elite, 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 but he's pretty good, right? He's a good, good baseball player. So checking in here on the comment section, Marcus Simeon at 48? Dude just had one of the best hitting seasons for a second baseman of all time, and that's a correct sentiment, right? I mean, he did set the single season home run record for second baseman. However, you're talking about the past, and I'm talking about the future. And look, we can use the past to inform our thoughts on the future, but that involves looking at a lot of the peripheral stats, maybe not the surface level stats, like how many home runs did he hit? And I just didn't believe in Marcus Simeon and his ability to repeat. He didn't. Uh, in this case, I was correct, although, you know, a good point. He had an amazing season in 2021. That does not guarantee a good season in 2022. Number 47, Anthony Rendon, Tony Two Bags. Uh, 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 is there anything in this noggin of mine? Because I fell for it again. I had him ranked at fifth in 2021. Didn't work out. Said, hey, let's, let's do the benefit of the doubt thing, right? Didn't work either. And MLB Network had him ranked at 70th. So not a great look for me on this one, guys. 
Now, it is true that he only played 47 games, but it's not like he was setting the world on fire in those 47 games with a 326 on base, 380 slug. That adds up to a 101 OPS plus, which is basically league average. 100 is league average, 0.8 F4 on the season, not a top 50 player. You know, I, I do like Rendon. Um, I do hope his contract doesn't turn into an albatross, but it seems to be training that direction, and that's unfortunate for the Angels. I think people want to see the Angels succeed because they have Trout and Otani. Number 46, JT Realmuto. This is a really tough pick to grade. JT Realmuto had an amazing season, the type of season that really said, hey, I know I'm always in the conversation for best catcher in Major League Baseball, but how about I just make it abundantly clear that I am indeed the best catcher in Major League Baseball? What's tough about it is just the ranking, right? I had him ranked 46th. LB Network, this is fake news. They did not have him ranked 34th. They had him ranked 54th. LB Network did not rank a single catcher in their top 50 this year, and I disagree with that. Yet at the same time, I ranked two catchers ahead of Real Muto. So, you know, how, how do we come to terms with that? I mean, the guy had 6.5 fan graphs where he had a 129 OPS plus. You can actually see this FRM right here. I only have it for the catchers. That's framing according to fan graphs. Uh, but yeah, 6.5 F4, that puts him right on the cusp of that top 10. Incredible season for JT Realmuto, a career year for JT Realmuto. And, you know, it's good I had him in the top 50 and NLB Network didn't. That's good for me. What's bad for me is that I had two catchers ranked ahead of him. Number 45, Brandon Crawford. Blep, blep, miss. Big time miss. I, You know, it's tough because I really want to recognize his 2020 and 2021. He was excellent player both those years. Definitely a top 50 player in MLB. But I think I kind of fell for the idea of, well, surely his past performance will measure future performance. It didn't. And I think, you know, maybe the aging curve got the best of him. Uh, MLB Network had him ranked 58th outside of their top 50. So uh, a win for them, a loss for me. And it's a loss for me because Brandon Crawford wasn't anywhere near a top 50 player in Major League Baseball this year. In 118 games played, he had a 85 OPS plus, which is well below average with the bat and not in line with his performance the previous two years. Plus seven stat cast outs above average at shortstop. That does contribute to a lot of his value. It gives him two F4, which basically makes him a league average full-time player. But again, not even sniffing the top 50. Uh, not a good pick on my part there. Number 44, Jordan Alvarez. This is a really interesting case for me because I was debating leaving him off the 50, you know, because it's it, he had a good season in 2021, but maybe not an amazing one, and he doesn't have much defensive value to contribute. So it's like, yeah, what do I do with Jordan? Ended up putting him at 44. It worked out in the sense that I at least had him on my list, and MLB Network had him at 46, so we were on the same page. But he absolutely exploded this year. He was one of the absolute best players in Major League Baseball, and here's why. He was one of the best players because he's one of the best hitters. He had a 300 batting average, 400 on base, 600 slugging, adding up to a 187 OPS plus, 6.6 F4. That puts him right around the 10 spot. Uh, negative eight outs above average, you know, playing some DH, playing some corner outfield. Not much to contribute there defensively. However, when you hit like Jordan Alvarez, it doesn't really matter. He's an incredible player, incredible young player. I'm very excited to see where his career goes from here. Number 43, Pete Alonso. This was a player I believed in a lot more than MLB Network. They had him ranked at 62, almost 20 spots behind me. Why did I believe so much in Pete Alonso? It was because of a reduction in strikeouts and the swing and miss in 2021 that I thought really bode well for 2022, and it did overall. I think he had a really good season. Let's check in on those numbers. So if you went strictly by F4, which I don't recommend, especially for, you know, guys who are great hitters, but maybe not the best defenders, you know, he had four, which would technically put him outside that top 50 threshold. But do I think Pete Alonso was a top 50 player in Major League Baseball this year? Yes, absolutely. I mean, at a 146 OPS plus, that's, that's elite hitting. And, you know, he played 160 games, 685 plate appearances. So he was there every day. Negative eight outs above average as a first baseman. He's never graded well as a first baseman, and that's going to affect you know, his bottom line in terms of his wins above replacement. But a great season for Pete Alonso. I'm very proud to have had him on my top 50. What can I say? Number 42, Max Muncy. This is a really hard player to rank coming into 2022 because around August of 2021, it looked like he might win the National League MVP. He ended up getting hurt at the end of the season. He has surgery, and you just don't know what he's going to give you in 2022. MLB Network had him ranked at 35th, so actually ahead of me. How did Max Muncy end up doing this year? I'm sad to say the answer is 
not great. He had a 196 batting average. He's always been a low batting average, low BABIP kind of guy. But, you know, even with a 329 on base, which is roughly average, 384 slugging, that adds up to a 96 OPS plus, basically saying he was an average to below average hitter in Major League Baseball. Adds up to 2.4 F4 for him on this season. This was just not, it was not a top 50 season for Max Muncy. A miss on my part, a miss on MLB Network's part, although based on past performance, it would have been hard to leave him off because like I said, MVP candidate not that long ago. Uh, hopefully he will bounce back in 2023. I think there's a good chance he actually will. If you're here to laugh at my failures, which look, I don't blame you. I'm an entertainer. I'm entertaining you either way. If you're here to laugh, start chuckling because I rank Nolan Arnado as my 41st best player going into 2022. That is so much worse than any other person with a brain would rank him. LB Network had him ranked in 19th. What does he do? Goes out MVP finalist this year. Amazing year. Squashes all the doubt that he can hit in St. Louis. I look like a big fat doofus. So yeah, total news flash to me, but it turns out Nolan Arenado is still amazing at baseball. Let's check in on the numbers here. 293 batting average. I'm a bad guy. 358 on base percentage. I'm a bad and stupid guy. 533 slugging percentage. I should be thrown in jail. 154 OPS plus. After I'm thrown in jail, my family should never speak my name again. Plus 15 outs above average. After I die in jail, I should be thrown into the garbage. 7.3 Fangraphs war. I am garbage. Checking in on my viewer reactions at the time, Nolan reworked his swing at driveline and looks a lot better. Watch him get a 7 war season. I mean, that, that is exactly what happened. Thankfully, I can recover here because Sandy Alcantara, I had him ranked at 40, MLB Network had him ranked at 84, and then he goes out and he wins unanimous National League Cy Young. Amazing. I love Sandy. I love how I feel about this pick. Obviously, look, he was probably like a top 10 player in MLB this year, but if you look at me versus the industry, I was super confident, and I think it paid off. I really do feel like I'm taking my victory lap here. 228 and two-thirds innings pitched. MLB Network, what were you doing? 2.28 ERA. Were you asleep at the wheel? Uh, incredible season for Mr. Sandy Alcantara. But you know who else saw it coming? Jolly Olive. Jolly Olive said Sandy number 40. Wow, like he was surprised. Oh my gosh, Bailey, you believe in Sandy Alcantara so much, buddy. You made a video calling him the Dark Horse Cy Young, and then he actually did it. He actually did it. Sandy, you absolute mad lad. Number 39, St. Louis left fielder Tyler O'Neill. I've said it many times in my head. It's finally time to say it out loud. You can't trust people from Canada. That's it. You just can't trust Canadians. I had him 39, MLB Network 42. I thought he was the best left fielder in MLB coming into this year despite some scary plate discipline stuff. Didn't work out for either of us. 96 games played, 101 OPS plus when he did play. So you're talking about a corner outfielder who is basically a league average hitter. That's just not going to cut it when you're talking about a top 50. And then the plus one stat cast outs above average, I'm also a little bit frustrated by. You know, a single season sample size for a defensive metric, not always going to be the most accurate. And you know, that that's why F4 has, you know, a margin of error there because a lot of it is the defense. You, it's hard to measure that properly over the course of one season. But, you know, this was a guy who his defense was such a big component of his game and he graded out as, once again, basically average there. So 1.3 F4 in 96 games, not sniffing the top 50, not a good pick on my part. Not a good pick on LB Network's part, but it's worse for me because can you believe I ranked this guy over his teammate Nolan Arenado? Stupid. Number 38, Francisco Lindor. Woohoo! Buddy, now we're talking. Sorry, my microphone clipped a little bit there. Lindor, I rank him 38 this year after I rank him 23 last year. So I get to go from being the ultimate Francisco Lindor doubter to the Francisco Lindor truther while MLB Network, they overreact. They rank him 68 after a rough debut with the Mets in 2021. And I'm right. He killed it this year. Let's check on those numbers. Some of you Mets fans watching this are probably aware that I'm a Braves fan. Hey, how does it feel to know that I, a Braves fan, believed in your guys, Francisco Lindor and Pete Alonso, more than you did and was totally vindicated? We're talking about a 125 OPS plus, which is great for a shortstop. And speaking of shortstop, plus 13 outs above average at the shortstop position. You combine that, that's elite value right there. That's 6.8 fan graphs war. According to F4, that's a top 10 player. Will I rank him in the top 10 going into next year? No, no. 
no, 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 I don't think I will, but he had a fantastic year. Great job, Francisco Lindor. Totally deserving of being on the top 50, but I was the guy that did it. Not everyone would have done it. I mean, you can see the sentiment in the comments just seven months ago. Francisco Lindor is not good. Well, you, sir, Dwayne Wise, you, sir, well, you are good, right? You are good because you made that amazing catch in Mark Burley's perfect game. But when it comes to this comment, this comment is not good. Number 37, Wander Franco. This was just supposed to be the uber prospects coming out party. His first full season in Major League Baseball was going to ascend into superstardom. Just wanted to make sure I had him on my top 50. It didn't happen. He, he only really played half the season, so that didn't really work out in his favor. MLB Network had him ranked at 40 like I did. Let's really see how the numbers shook out. And yeah, I think this is a case of maybe being just a year too early. Granted, he only played 83 games, but he had a 117 OPS plus, which, you know, at the shortstop position, that's quite good. Plus one outs above average, it just sort of shows his skill set is basically a guy who's really good at everything, but maybe not elite anywhere. 2.3 F4 in 83 games, I mean, if you extrapolated that to a 150 game season, he'd be close to that top 50 margin. But yeah, both myself and MLB Network, we're maybe a little too bullish, a little too confident going into this year. Am I going to leave you know, Wander Franco off my top 50 next year? Probably not. I, I, I don't want to get caught flat-footed. Number 36, Shane Bieber. I'm a Shane Bieber enjoyer myself. I really like any sort of, you know, crazy, like, low walk rate guy, and I feel like he really personifies that in MLB across his career. Big drop for him on this list, according to my ranking. He was ranked 12th in 2021. He comes in at 36th in 2022. This is because I was a little bit concerned about some of the fluctuations in velocity throughout his career, but now at the end of 2022, it's hard to argue with the results. Because the results are 200 innings pitched across 31 starts and a 2.88 ERA and a FIP to match. You know, maybe not the craziest year for him in terms of the strikeout rates, but hard to argue with the results. I think this is a ace pitcher. You know, I think an ace gives you volume. I think an ace gives you, you know, good run prevention. And Shane Bieber gets both. Number 35, Brandon Lau. This guy was a huge hit for me on the 2021 version of this list. I had him ranked at 49th. He ended up having a great 2021 Honestly, through 2021, he was one of the best offensive second basemen in MLB history. That's no exaggeration. This year, I move him up to 35. MLB Network still lagging behind at 56, but they get the better of me this year. This was not a great year for Brandon Lau. Towards the end of this video, I will be looking at players that were on my top 50 and not MLB Networks and vice versa. This is going to be a case where MLB Network get the victory over me. Uh, Brandon Lau, only 65 games played, so you could argue even when he played, maybe he was playing hurt. But 102 OPS+, plus, that's a league average hitter. That's not great for him because he's never been a great defender at second base. Negative four outs above average, 0.9 F4, not sniffing a top 50 player. Love Brandon Lau, still love the guy to death, but not a top 50 player in 2022. L. Number 34, Rafael Devers. This guy, he's trickier to rank than you think. And I think a lot of people felt like I'd underranked him. I actually kind of thought I'd overranked him. You know, when I started making the list, he was in probably the 40s and he kept moving up, moving up, moving up because I'd be like, man, he's so young and his stat cast data is so nice. But yet at the same time, you know, defense for him, that's been a, a topic of discussion, I should say. Very young, amazing hitter. What do we think of Rafael Devers in 2022? To be fair, it's not like I was totally out on an island with Brandon Lau either. You know, this is from the live stream premiere of the Foolish 50. Love Lau. W. Lau. Best second baseman in the league. So, sorry guys, this just, this was not our year. I mean, again, if you want to be extremely literal, at 4.9 F4, he probably is exactly where I ranked him. Uh, 141 OPS plus at third base. That's incredible. That's that's sticky. You know, like that's legit. Negative two outs above average at third base. That's harder to say because you need bigger sample sizes. And of course, that's going to contribute to his war as well. So I would prioritize, you know, offense over defense. I know he's an amazing hitter. At the same time, you've seen fluctuations with the defense. I think he's shown improvement according to at least the eye test. So I'm going to say Rafael Devers, long-term third baseman for the Boston Red Sox, hopefully. Um, but as far as him versus maybe some other Red Sox players, well, we'll just check in on that in a couple spots. Number 33, George Springer. You know, when you talk about putting him versus someone like Devers, it's like, well, George Springer, also a great bat. Maybe not as good as Devers, but he plays center field, which is a premium defensive position, and that can be a difference maker. LB Network also had him ranked at 33rd, but for me, at 33, you know, that's actually a drop down from his 2021 rank, which was 20. And the reason is, hey, you know, he's had some injury stuff in the past, and he's getting another year older, and he's on the wrong side of 30. So, you know, that aging curve, you have to ride it either way. So, uh, do love George Springer. Let's see how he did this year. 
So Springer did manage to play mostly the full season, which I can't say he did in 2021. He played about half the season. In 2022, 133 games played, 583 played appearances. And, you know, the Blue Jays were sprinkling him in there at DH to try to, you know, keep his legs fresh. 131 OPS plus, plus one outs above average in the outfield adds up to a 4.2 F war. Uh, that's going to be right on the cusp of that top 50. Again, I ranked him the same as MLB Network did. He'll probably drop a little bit just because he's going to be another year older and maybe he's going to get a little bit less value from his defense because maybe he gets a little more DH time. It's tough to say with a guy like George Springer, but really quality bat. And that is the thing that is easiest to be confident in in this game. It's not so much, you know, the defense and the base running. Those can be finicky on the metrics, but the batting, he's a great hitter, you know? Xander Bogarts, Mr. Consistent. I did indeed rank him ahead of Rafael Devers. I love Bogarts. He has like the same season every year. There's no one more consistent than this guy. He plays every game. He plays shortstop. He hits the ball really, really well. And the thing with Bogarts is you might rank certain players ahead of them because they have a higher perceived upside, but you also know, hey, if I'm ranking Bogarts 32, there's a good chance he ends up better than the 32nd best player because that's just kind of typical for him, a typical season finish. So as far as the offense, it was very standard, very good season for him. 307 average, 377 on base, 456 slug, adds up to a 131 OPS plus. But in terms of the defensive metrics, and again, this is small sample, just one season, plus five. And, you know, he'd been generally viewed as a negative with the glove, you know, someone who plays shortstop but doesn't really, you know, excel there. And this year, plus five outs above average, that's going to combine to give him a 6.1 F4, make him one of the top 15 or so players by F4 this year in Major League baseball yeah really really excellent season for Xander Bogarts and I want to check in here on some of the feedback because this was a sentiment I saw reflected a lot particularly by Red Sox fans Xander is not better than Devers I think you could definitely make the argument that Xander Bogarts was better than Rafael Devers this year his offensive numbers weren't quite up to Devers' standards yet at the same time Bogarts probably had more to contribute defensively so they end up coming pretty close 31, Cattell Marte. Oh, buddy, that is a bad, bad, bad pick for me and made even worse by the fact that MLB Network had him ranked 72nd and I moved him up from 42 in 2021. 2021, he played about half the year. He was phenomenal. He was really good in 2021. So I was like, hey, bump him up. And it did not work at all. Cattell Marte, my highest ranked second baseman in the league this year. Let's see what happened. 137 games played and a 106 OPS plus just barely an above average hitter in Major League Baseball this year and a huge bummer is negative six stat cast outs above average because one reason I really liked Marte this year is because he was just going to be a full-time second baseman. He'd been playing a lot of center field in previous years and he seemed better suited for second base according to stat cast this year. Not the case, not a good defender, not a lot of value from his defense. It adds up to 1.4 F4 which is actually below the league average mark you know, of 2F4 for a full-time, full-season player. So this is a huge bummer, and it's just, I look real bad for this just because I was so bullish on him, right? Like, totally, you know, huge gap between myself and MLB Network, 31 versus 72. So overall, I'm looking like a doofus. Number 30, Will Smith. This is a pick i just not sure if I know what to make of it because, look, was Will Smith a top 30 player in Major League Baseball this year? No, I don't think so. But would Will Smith deserve to be on a foolish 50? Yeah, I mean, maybe. You could definitely argue it. Uh, a good season, a good young catcher, one that hits pretty well. But at the same time, when you have him ranked ahead of Real Muto, it's not a great look for me. 120 OPS plus is a fairly young catcher. Like, that is exciting. Don't get me wrong. He's a very good player, and yet it's not an amazing season and there were catchers who definitely hit better than him and you know you talk about this the framing uh, a plus one according to fan graphs that's pretty good but it only adds up to 3.9 f4 which technically puts him outside that top 50 threshold by just a little bit yeah this is a case of will smith and you look at it and you say he had a good season it just maybe wasn't a great season one that is for sure slam dunk a top 30 player in mlb Number 29, Brian Reynolds. I would almost hesitate to call his 2021 a breakout because he was really good in his 2019 rookie campaign. In some ways, it was more of a return to form than anything, but Brian Reynolds was very confident in him going into this year. LB Network had him ranked 43rd, so I was more confident in Reynolds. And in the end, it's kind of a similar outcome to the Will Smith thing where you're talking about a guy who, yes, he had a good season, but it was not a top 30 season. 
A 126 OPS plus as an outfielder who's a good base runner in a full season, like, that's good. You know, that's really good. But also negative seven outs above average, like, that was some serious defensive regression. A lot of how I rated him was based on the idea that he was at least a league average center fielder, and that didn't appear to be the case this year, at least according to StantCast. 2.9 F4, that puts him outside that top 50 threshold, so... Uh, A relative loss for me versus MLB Network. They did have him ranked 10 spots behind me. Actually, I believe 13 spots behind me. So uh, not a great look there with Brian Reynolds, but also it's not like he's a terrible player. Surely I wouldn't rank any terrible players in my top 50, right? Why? Why? What happened? Why would I rank Yasmani Grandal number 28 in baseball, the number one catcher, and then he goes and does this to me? 64 OPS plus. I'm sorry, I thought I was rating Yasmani Grandal, not Jeff Mathis. I mean, what an incredible downturn. In the exact same sample size last year, he was one of the best hitters in MLB. And this year, 64 OPS plus, 301 on base, 269 slugging, 269, hit the gym. What happened? It's it's unbelievable. It's it's almost unfathomable. Negative F war. Negative F war. I rank this man as the 28th best player in Major League Baseball. Ugh. It is just a disaster. It's a disaster. And people, you people, you viewers knew it. Seven months ago, this comment with three thumbs up, might I add, no. Grandal is not the best catcher. You're right. It's JT Raulmuto. Of course, it should have been obvious to me all along. Why did you not put Salvi on this list? I take everything back. You, sir, do not know ball. Number 27, Walker Buehler. I'm calling this a relative win because MLB Network had him ranked at 17th, and I think we had a little bit of disagreements of where Walker Buehler ranked among other starting pitchers in the league. Uh, Walker Buehler at 27 for me, the only real pitching pick on this list that didn't work out at all. The rest had varying degrees of success. 12 starts, 65 innings pitched, ERA just a smidge over 4, which really isn't great when you're pitching in Dodger Stadium in 2022. Added up to 1F4 for him, but again, this is an incomplete season for Walker Buehler, heading for recovery from his second Tommy John surgery in his professional career. It's a bummer. This guy's, you know, young, he's talented, he's got a chance to bounce back from this, but it was definitely not the 2022 anyone was expecting Walker Buehler to have. Uh, I can at least take a little bit solace in the fact that I didn't like him as much as MLB Network, but still, it's 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 bad. It, it sucks. It's the only real big pitcher miss here. Number 26, Brandon Woodruff. I really waffled back and forth between him and Bueller. Ended up putting Woodruff ahead of Bueller. And look, this was not an amazing season for Woodruff by any means. I think there were some Brewers fans that were actually disappointed with how it went. And I was maybe a little disappointed too. You know, Woodruff was my flashy, you know, top 50 pick, you know, the equivalent of a Logan Webb last year. And I was happy to move him up this list. LB Network had him at 38. Let's check in on the numbers for Mr. Brandon Woodruff of the Milwaukee Brewers. You know, at face value, like the strikeouts and the three ERA and the three FIP, like that all looks really nice. It's really nice on a rate basis, but what I found a little bit disappointing is it seemed like the volume wasn't quite there for him. Only 153 innings pitched and 29 starts. He had definitely been more efficient than that at times in his career. I know, you know, his manager is Craig Council. Craig Council is going to turn it over to the bullpen when he wants, but... It seems like he could have gotten more volume. It seems like there were starts there where, you know, he was really struggling to get through that fifth or that sixth inning, or he wasn't trusted to go a third time through the order. And when you're talking about a pitcher you want to rank in the top 50, you're talking about an ace, you're talking about someone who's going to give you that volume. So there's an element of disappointment in that for me, although it's not like Brandon Woodruff is a terrible pitcher. He's still a really good pitcher. Number 25, Chicago's Luis Robert. This is one of those guys where, you know, when you consider what I was saying about Bogarts, right? Bogarts, a known commodity, but he ends up getting ranked behind mystery box players. And that's what Luis Robert was. He had such a crazy potential upside coming into this year with his power and the defense he plays in center. And I don't really think it worked out. I had him ranked, you know, very confidently at 25. Felt great about him. And it'll be network 50. And granted, Robert did not play the full season, you know, 98 games, 401 plate appearances, but that's a, that's a solid enough sample size. And, you know, he turned up with a 109 OPS plus and plus two outs above average in the outfield for two F4. You know, it's not 
it's not awful. It's definitely not awful, but it's not the type of upside I was anticipating when I ranked him in my top 25. He was not anywhere close to a top 25 player in MLB this year. He is one of those guys where I think you could give him that benefit of the doubt type ranking in the 40s where you say, hey, maybe things didn't go your way in 2022, but in 2023, I recognize the upside. I recognize the potential you have, and so I want to respect that. Number 24, Paul Goldschmidt. You know, this might sound like, you know, cope or like some sort of like revisionist take on history, but I really did like Paul Goldschmidt a lot coming into this year. That's why I moved him up six spots from number 30 in 2021, despite his age, despite being another year older. Uh, I think Paul Goldschmidt's going to win MVP this year. He had just a phenomenal 2022. MLB Network had him ranked at 27th, so we were in a similar enough range there. I mean, that ranking at 24th is just not accurate, right? When you're talking about someone who had a 317 average, 404 on base, 578 slugging for a 180 OPS plus, 7.1 F4, that puts him as a top five player. And again, this is this is most likely your National League MVP. So, you know, you could call it a miss on my part, but at least I didn't make some awful mistake and like underrate him like crazy like I did with his teammate Nolan Arenado, for example. You know, one sentiment I got was, hey, people are still sleeping on Paul Goldschmidt. And I thought, well, why are you saying that after I ranked him 24th? You know, why are you saying that after I ranked him as a top 20 position player going into the year? And then, you know, that comment was proven right. He, he's an MVP. He had an incredible MVP type of year. And I guess I was still sleeping on him, just like a lot of people were. 23, Byron Buxton. This is similar to the Luis Robert pick, right? This is just upside, upside, upside. I don't want to rank this guy too low in case he does just go out there and have a 10-war season and win MVP. Uh, MLB Network had him at the 39 spot, and, you know, it's it's unfortunate for me just to see him paired with someone like Goldschmidt at 24 for me to say, hey, I ranked Byron Buxton ahead of Paul Goldschmidt this year because of perceived upside, and then Goldschmidt hit that perceived upside that I, you know, initially dismissed from him, and it didn't quite happen for Byron Buxton for the usual reasons. He was really good when he played. He had four F4 in 92 games. If you extrapolate that to 150 games, he's on pace to being, you know, a top 15, top 10 player easily in the league because of, you know, 135 OPS plus an elite, elite, elite center field defense and base running. But again, the same thing, you know, that happens through his career reared its ugly head. He did not play a full season in Major League Baseball. He did not qualify for the batting title. Will he be on the Foolish 50 next year? Yes, absolutely, because... Because you got to believe. Number 22, Mad Max Scherzer. This is one of those cases where I had a little bit of a divergence from MLB Network. They had him ranked at 12th. I had him ranked at 22nd, which was actually moving up the list for him at his age because he was ranked 32nd on the 2021 edition of this list. Uh, Max Scherzer had an excellent season that he just so happened to get hurt in the middle of, and that was kind of a bummer. These are his numbers across 23 starts. If he had managed to play the full season, he probably would have had 31 or 32 starts. 2.29 ERA. It's really hard to argue with that. 2.29 ERA. That is a fantastic showing for Max Scherzer when he did pitch for the New York Mets in his first season with that ball club. 4.4 F4, despite having missed that much time and, and wins above replacement being a volume type stat, he does manage to sneak into that top 50 threshold. So, you know, that's, that's all I can say to really sum it up. Max Scherzer had a really good season that he unfortunately got injured in the middle of. Number 21, Matt Olson. It's it's kind of the Pete Alonso thing for me. You know, I loved Matt Olson just like I love Pete Alonso because you're talking about this great raw power hitter who cut his strikeout significantly in 2021. And unlike Alonso, who, you know, really turned those gains into a fantastic 2022 season, we saw some serious regression from Matt Olson. And for me to have him at 21 ahead of Goldschmidt, that is a huge loss. And it'll be network to have him at, you know, 26. They weren't that much better than myself either. I mean, if you look at his games played and his plate appearances, like, yeah, he was an Iron Man, but 122 OPS plus, if you're trying to be like a borderline top 20 player, that at first base just isn't going to cut it. And, you know, he is a great defensive first baseman, plus three outs above average there, but it adds up into a 3.1 F4, which puts him more on the cusp of being a top 100 player, not so much a top 20 player. I think Olsen has a good chance to rebound from this to improve upon his game a lot in 2023. Because again, we've talked about that second year effect. You know, players who have played their career with one team, whether it's a Harper, Machado, Lindor, you know, uh, Goldschmidt, Arenado, then they move to the new team. Year two, I think they get a little bit more comfortable. So I have high hopes for Matt Olson. I'll be curious to see if I rank him in the 50 next year. 
Number 20, Zach Wheeler. I thought this guy should have won the Cy Young Award in 2021 just because of the volume of his performance versus uh, Corbin Burns. Uh, this was a case where I had Wheeler ahead of Scherzer, and then MLB Network had the opposite. They had Scherzer ahead of Wheeler. They both, you know, missed some starts throughout the season. And look, when when both of those guys pitched, they were both good, but I do think Max Scherzer ended up getting the better of me here. 26 starts, 153 innings pitched, 2.82 ERA, 2.89 FIP. There were times where Zach Wheeler just looked like 2021 Zach Wheeler, and he was just dominating. And there were times where he didn't, and you saw you know, some decreases in his velocity and his fastball from year to year. And so it's tough to say exactly where he would be ranked on a Foolish 50 next year. You know, there's a lot of, I think, parity among the pitching rankings as a whole. Uh, you know, there's not that much of a difference between being the fifth best pitcher and the 15th best pitcher, I would say. 4.1 F4, that puts him just outside of the top 50 in terms of F4, but then again, missed some starts. So kind of a mixed bag of results for Zach Wheeler. I don't want to underrate what he did. I mean, a 2.82 ERA, that that is really impressive, but it wasn't quite the follow-up to 2021 that we were all expecting. Number 19, Corey Seager in his first year with the Texas Rangers. The thing about me is I'm going to overrate Corey Seager until the day I die. That's just how I roll. I love me some Corey Seager. I'm a Corey Seager eager believer. That's what I'm just going to say about that right there. LB Network also had him ranked at, you know, 21st, so it's not like we disagreed by any means. But Corey Seager, a good first year with the Texas Rangers, just not a great one, not a top 20 one. 151 games played. I mean, for a guy with his history, that's an excellent outcome. 119 OPS plus for a shortstop, that's pretty great. Plus four outs above average. Again, for a guy with his defensive reputation, that's a great outcome. 4.5 F4, that's, you know, just inside that top 50 cutoff there. I can already feel, I can already feel the momentum building. I'm going to trick myself. I'm going to say this year, you know, 2023, he's going to break out. He's going to do the second year thing that those other guys I talked about did. So yes, next year, will I be overrating Corey Seager again? Yes, I will. I will continue to do that and I will not be stopped. Number 18, Kyle Tucker. People were very surprised that I rated him this high. This was a player I really stuck my neck out for. Said, hey, this guy I think is a top 20 player in Major League Baseball going into the 2022 season. As you can see, MLB Network had him ranked at 30. I think he got kind of unlucky in the early months of the season, and that prevented him from putting up a season that you would really consider to be a top 20 season overall. If you go by F4, it was a top 50 season at 4.7. He had a 128 OPS plus, and he's just a really toolsy player, plus four outs above average in the outfield, also a very good base runner, just a really excellent baseball player all around. I think people will be surprised when I rate him very highly again next season, uh, but I really think he has a lot more to show than what he did in 2022. I think he got kind of unlucky if you look at some of the stat cast numbers in particular, and I consider him to be one of the better players in Major League Baseball. And I don't think I'm alone in that sentiment at all. As you can see from some of the live stream reactions from the Foolish 50 premiere, people were excited to see Kyle Tucker ranked just this highly. Everyone, you know, was really feeling that ranking. It just didn't quite manifest how I wanted it to this season. Number 17, Manny Machado. Absolutely phenomenal year. Uh, I had him ranked at 17 versus MLB Network at 18, so I can't really take credit for believing in him any more than they did. Although I will point out that I moved him up eight spots from his 2021 ranking, so I was really feeling you know, a Machado improvement this year, but boy, he just absolutely exploded. One of the best, if not the best years of his career, finishing as an NL MVP finalist. And that was key, especially because Fernando Tatis Jr. was absent this season. So Machado really stepped up. A 159 OPS plus, plus 9 outs above average at that hot corner, adding up to 7.4 F4, a top 5 player in the league by F4 this year. And like I previously said, at the moment of recording, it's just been revealed that he is, in fact, the runner-up for National League MVP. So good for Machado. Number 16, Carlos Correa. You know, a kind of interesting measuring stick I felt like for a season was that he played well enough to feel confident enough to opt out of his deal with the Minnesota Twins. That was kind of a weird deal he signed, considering what a marquee free agent he was, but he is once again a free agent, and once again, you know, hoping to command a $300 million contract this time. Good season for Carlos Correa, as he lands at 16 on my list, number 14 for MLB Network. 
One thing that definitely has caught my eye, though, is the negative three stat cast outs above average. He is graded really highly in some other defensive metrics throughout his career. His defensive run save totals from previous seasons have been kind of wild, so it's interesting to see stat cast be a little bit negative on him as a defender at shortstop. I don't expect that to continue. His arm alone is just absolutely insane at the shortstop position. 4.4 F4 this year. I expect that it'll be higher in 2023 if he manages to play 136 games or more. Number 15, Freddie Freeman. In his first season with the Los Angeles Dodgers, I thought he was nothing short of excellent. It was another sort of vintage Freddie Freeman year, and in fact, it was actually an improvement on his 2021 performance. Uh, I had dropped him from 13 to 15 going into the season. MLB Network had him at the 9 spot, and I think if you were just to compare him to the rest of Major League Baseball, he would probably be closer to that 9 spot than the 15 spot I personally ranked him at for 2022. The numbers on this season really are just incredible. You know, in over 700 plate appearances, so we're talking about just crazy volume playing every day in a potent lineup hitting towards the top of it. 325 batting average, 407 on base, 511 slug, adds up to a 152 OPS plus in Dodger Stadium. Also had an out above average plus one total there at first base to give him 7.1 fan graphs wins above replacement, which is right on the cusp of that top five threshold we've talked about a few times. So incredible season for Freddie Freeman. You know, he showed up in Atlanta. He was weepy. He had a lot of feelings. He had a lot of emotions. But if he had any regrets about moving to LA, I don't think it showed with his performance on the field. He was great. Number 14 was another Los Angeles Dodger. This time it was Trey Turner. I felt like I was rating him low at the time. I put him at 14, but his past performance in, say, 2020 and 2021 would have given him the reputation of a top 10 player, which is why I was a little bit surprised that MLB Network and I agreed because they ranked him at 13. I thought MLB Network for sure would have him as a top 10 player. But no, I think we kind of saw the same things. And look, I mean, if you look at the numbers, it's another really, really good season for Trey Turner. 121 OPS plus, league average defense at shortstop, which is very valuable. And that doesn't even account for the fact that he's one of the absolute best base runners and best base dealers in Major League Baseball. 6.3 F4, again, if we take it really literally, that's just outside the top 10. But uh, Trey Turner, excellent player, also a free agent. I'll be curious to see what direction he goes. Number 13, Garrett Cole, you know, as the highly paid ace of the New York Yankees, this guy is often maligned, and I don't think it really helped that he did take a bit of a step back this year versus last year, but he's still a wonderful pitcher, but he does tend to allow some home runs, and that's what kind of got him this year. He comes in at number 13 for me, number 16 for MLB Network. And the main culprit here is indeed that 1.5 home runs allowed per nine innings. That's not very good. And, you know, when you have a guy like Cole, you're talking about someone who is going to allow a lot of his runs via the long ball. And this year he had a 3.50 ERA. Helps to contextualize that and say, hey, look, the offense is league-wide took a step back this year. And so when you talk about a 3.50 ERA, that might have been like, pretty elite in, say, 2019, but in 2022, it's good, but there are a lot of pitchers who bested him there, who had a better fielding independent pitching than him. 200 innings, that is still ace-like volume, but it adds up to 3.3 F war, which by the war cutoff isn't even, you know, a top 50 player in Major League Baseball for 2022. Now look, does that mean he's going to drop some spots? Absolutely. Does that mean he's going to drop off the foolish 50? I doubt it. Number 12, Corbin Burns. I was very intentional about how I ranked Corbin Burns, particularly versus Garrett Cole. I had Burns ahead of Cole. And will be network, it was the opposite. They had Cole ahead of Burns. And I think this gambit sort of worked out for me in the end. Uh, Corbin Burns, this was not like the crazy peripherals we saw in 2021 when he won the Cy Young Award. But there is one big, big reason why I really enjoyed this Corbin Burns season in particular. And that's the volume. He threw over 200 innings, which surprised me. You know, in 2021, Craig Council was very particular about how he used his starting pitchers coming off of the shortened season in 2020. He knew he had a really good bullpen. So even though Corbin Burns was absolutely setting it on fire in 2021, he wasn't always pitching the deepest into his games. And this year, it was like, you know, he was let off the reins a little bit and he was able to throw 200 innings and he had an ERA below three and he still struck out a lot of guys. So overall, I think a very good season for Corbin Burns, even though it wasn't a Cy Young season or a Cy Young finalist season. I think I think he continues to be one of the best starting pitchers in Major League Baseball in 2023. 
you know, from the feedback, we had Burns being greater than Cole is a W take. It did turn out to be a W take this year. I had to do some thinking about it, but overall, I'm pretty happy with my pick of Corbin Burns. Number 11, Mookie Betts. Ranking him outside of the top 10 was a really hard thing to do. I don't know if it was the right thing to do. On the 2021 version of my Foolish 50, he was indeed ranked number two, just behind Mike Trout. And will be nowhere had him at six this year. And for me to have him outside the top 10, there were just so many guys I felt like were deserving of a top 10 spot. And Betts was sort of the man that was left out. Now, was this the correct decision? We'll have to take a look at the numbers. I think he was right on the border of being a top 10 player in Major League Baseball this year. F4 will agree with me. I do want to point out where it says that 304 on base percentage got my numbers mixed up there when I made the card. It was actually 340. Uh, as soon as I pulled it up right now, I was like, that's not right. 136 OPS plus, elite defense, elite base running. He's Mookie Betts. We kind of know who he is. I think that 2018 season is ultimately going to be a bit of an outlier in his career when he threw down one of the absolute best seasons we've seen in the last decade or so, but he continues to produce an extremely high level, and I'll be curious to see if he indeed does break through back into that top 10 in 2023. So overall, when you're talking about that final spot in the top 10, it really came down to Vladdy Jr. versus Mookie Betts for me. Uh, MLB Network had both of these guys in their respective top 10s, and I ended up going with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. coming off an MVP runner-up finish in 2021 at a very young age. looked like he just completely unlocked his offense. He was going to be just a crazy elite hitter, one of the best in the league for years to come. And this year, I must say, not like he had a bad season at all, but definitely a step back and definitely not a top 10 player. And you know, I don't want to sound too nitpicky or critical, but when you're coming off a thousand OPS season and you put together this slash line and a 132 OPS plus and you know the idea is that you're going to be like a perennial MVP candidate and one of the absolute top hitters in the league it's a little disappointing and you know he's plenty young there's plenty more for him to unlock with regards to like the distribution of his batted balls particularly we're talking about the launch angles but it's kind of a disappointing result for Vladimir Guerrero Jr. 2.8 F4 actually puts him outside of that top 100 now, look, this is one of those things that's like, hey, this is the limitation of war, right? Do I think he was a top 100 player this year? Absolutely. Just war doesn't because of, you know, the defense at first base. So uh, disappointing. He's definitely going to drop some spots. But you also have to keep in mind the season to season upside in mind and as well as his age and the fact that he's on an incline on that aging curve. So be interesting to see where he ends up next year, but not a top 10 player. Number nine, Bryce Harper, one of my favorite players in MLB. He was coming off of an MVP season in 2021, and he's now a very difficult guy to talk about. He's got, you know, a tear in his UCL and his elbow, and, you know, that means he spent most of the season playing as a DH. It means he'll spend, you know, next season playing DH as well. Needs surgery, possibly Tommy John surgery, so it's tough to formulate sort of a long-term outlook for Harper, but when he played, and granted this was as a DH, he played well this year. He absolutely tore it up in the playoffs and, you know, led the Phillies to a pennant. So you could take a look at it and say, oh, yeah, 2.4 F4, that's way outside the top 50 and even the top 100. But, you know, we would have anticipated him to have more of a defensive component to his game, which he didn't have because he was a DH, so he's penalized there. He's penalized by his injury, only played 99 games. The fact of the matter remains he was a 145 OPS plus hitter, which is very, very, very good. So uh, I'm happy for Harper. I'm really happy for him just because he got a nice deep playoff run with the Phillies. Would have liked to have seen him bring it home, honestly. Didn't quite happen for him, but uh, Bryce Harper, uh, was it a good season? I think in terms of the Phillies it was for him, it was a bit of a grind, and he's definitely someone we'll be rooting for going into 2023. Will he be ranked in the top 10? I, I, I hesitate to say so. I think I'd lean towards no, just given sort of his long-term outlook coming off of what could be a Tommy John surgery. Number eight, Aaron Judge. This one is actually what I would call a relative win. MLB Network had him ranked at 11th, so for me to have Judge in the top 10, I would call that a relative win. Uh, was Aaron Judge the best player in Major League Baseball this season? I would say yes. I would say, you know, if you would go back and re-rank this season, he would come in at number one. Uh, it was a historical season, the best offensive season we've seen since Barry Bonds. So, you know, 20 years ago, that's what we're talking about. Absolutely incredible season from Aaron Judge. I mean, you just you just look at these numbers, and I must apologize a little bit here. I looks like I left over Bryce Harper's plate appearance total. Judges was obviously higher. He played in 157 games, but 211 
OPS plus. 211 OPS plus. That means he was more than twice as good as the league average hitter. This is this is video game. And I know it's cliche to say, but these are truly video game numbers. You know, I felt like 10 war, 10 wins above replacement was pretty much the best any player could hope for, you know, that was active in Major League Baseball, given how good the replacement level players have become, given the amount of parity in the league. Aaron Judge says, no, I'm going to have an 11 war season. I'm going to have 11.4 war. I'm going to lead the league in war by a substantial margin. I am Aaron Judge. You know, that's that's just how I roll. So an amazing season for Aaron Judge, absolutely generational, and now he's a free agent. One sentiment I did see that when people were nitpicking the rankings was they felt like Harper was better than Judge. And again, this is a past performance versus future or projected performance thing. Bryce Harper was better than Aaron Judge in 2021. I think that goes without saying. Bryce Harper won MVP. Judge was never really in the race. So Tani ran away with it. But you go to 2022, with the benefit of hindsight, I can easily say that Judge was better than Harper. And I'm feeling pretty good about ranking him as such. Number seven, Ronald Acuna Jr. You know, with this ranking, ranking him this high, I wanted to give him his flowers. And maybe I made the mistake of celebrating past performance rather than trying to project future performance here. Because in 2021, before he got injured about halfway through the season, he was on pace to be the National League MVP. He was absolutely tearing it up. You know, the Braves team overall was slumping, but he was just kind of dragging them along. They ended up winning the World Series without him. It was just a crazy thing. And then this year, he's coming off the ACL tear. And as you can see, it's not always easy to do that. You know, you look at these hitting stats overall. Are they above average? Yes, they are. They're above average. But are they great? No. Are they the type of stats that you would expect from a superstar, young, top 10 player in the league, supposedly? No, they're not. Uh, negative six outs above average. That's a bummer. You know, you could see coming off the ACL tear, I felt like, you know, the hitting was a little bit easier for him than some of the defense and the base running. You know, he still doesn't quite trust it yet when he's trying, you know, to make moves laterally and things like that. So 2.2 F4 on the season, it was basically just a slightly above average season for Ronald Acuna Jr. Braves had a very good year. Um, but yeah, I think he's going to drop some spots. I think there are some questions about just what that ACL tear means. But I think what we've also heard repeat a lot is, hey, you know, just because he came back from that doesn't mean he's 100%. He's going to really show what he's got in 2023. And I think I'll try to give him a ranking that gives him the benefit of the doubt. You know, if you thought Acuna's season was unfortunate, at least it wasn't Fernando Tatis Jr. Came into spring training injured from multiple motorcycle accidents, then suspended for the rest of the season due to PED usage. He didn't play. He did not play in 2022. This is the moment where I'm going to say, shout outs to Hassan Kim. He is not the stepfather, but he is the father that stepped up. Looking at his numbers here, you'll notice that there aren't any because once again, he did not play Major League Baseball in 2022. On a true talent level, is he a top 10 player in Major League Baseball? Absolutely. But in my ranking next year, I will have to account for the fact that A, he hasn't played in over a year and B, he's kind of a cheater. Coming into 2022, Jose Ramirez was number five for me, but number one in my heart. Jose Ramirez is my favorite player in Major League Baseball. He is so unique. He is so skilled. He does everything right. I can't believe MLB Network ranked him at 15th. They continue to underrank this guy. He's one of the absolute best players in the league. He has been nothing but elite for like the last five seasons, with the sole exception being the first half of 2019. That's really it. Jose Ramirez, amazing, amazing player. Let's check in on the stats of another amazing season. Okay, and sure, I'll cop to the fact that if you go by a very strict interpretation of F4, he would be outside the top 10, but he's just so good at freaking everything, man. 148 OPS plus, look at this guy, plus three outs above average at third base, runs the base paths like an absolute maniac. Jose Ramirez, God love him. God love him, Jose Ramirez. I salute you, sir. I salute you. I will fight and die for your honor every day when ranking you among other players in Major League Baseball. Number four, Jacob deGrom, you know, coming into this list and coming into the 2022 season, I was very careful with my words. I said, this is a true talent type of ranking. We can try to predict injuries to some degree, but I'm not interested in doing that fully. So I put deGrom in at fourth because he is, when healthy, the best starting pitcher in Major League Baseball. I knew coming into this year, he was only going to pitch maybe half of it. And when he did pitch, I thought overall he pitched pretty well and probably better than his ERA would indicate. But he's a tough player to talk about for sure. You know, if you were being super literal about it and you were thinking, okay, this is a true talent ranking, I have to rank these guys as if they were healthy, you would probably rank DeGrom 
first, to be honest with you. Like, that's how good he's been. In 2021, before he got hurt, he was going to have maybe the greatest pitching season in the modern era. Like, this is the type of talent we're talking about. This year, 11 games started, 3.08 ERA. You know, that's not crazy. That's not mind-blowing. But you look at some of these peripheral stats, he's striking out 14 per nine. Look at these walks, and you look at these home runs, which is really what kind of got him in the end. And you say to yourself, hey, if there's some home run fly ball regression... Yeah, we're talking about another crazy performance, another crazy low ERA from the best pitcher in Major League Baseball. So I'm going to continue to rank DeGrom highly, maybe not as high as number four, but you know, you just have to hope and pray and wish that he's able to put together a healthy season because if he does and you don't rank him highly, you're going to feel like a doofus. So in terms of ranking the top players in MLB, coming into this year, I think there was a very clear top three, and you could probably justifiably rank them in however order you wanted. I went with Mr. Shohei Otani as my number three pick, the two-way man himself, because he plays so much more baseball than anyone else, and I was just a little bit worried coming off of a 2021 year where he had so much more usage than anyone else if you looked at his batter's face as a pitcher and played appearances, just wasn't sure he was going to be able to maintain it. I was proven wrong. He went out and he did it again, folks. He truly did it again. This is a 2022 season that was just as good if not better than his 2021 unanimous MVP historic two-way season. And what's crazy is if you look at the hitting stats, as impressive as they are, this was actually a step back for him based off of, you know, last year. He was a better hitter in 2021. But whatever step back he may have suffered on offense... Look at his pitching. This was the best pitching season of his career in Major League Baseball. Many people felt like he should have been a Cy Young finalist in the American League. He had 5.6 F4, so if you go off just his pitching alone, he was a top 25 player. That's ignoring the fact that this guy hits. This guy hits, but look at the pitching stats. 2.33 ERA in 28 starts. Look at the strikeout rates. This guy is an absolute freak of nature, and I'll come out and say it. I was wrong to rank him at three. He should have been ranked higher. He was incredible. He did it again. Ted said it seven months ago. Otani number three, LOL, you clown. I was clowning. I was clowning. I was in the clown car. I had the clown makeup on. I didn't even know it at the time, but I was a clown. Number two, Juan Soto. MLB Network had him at fourth. I should also point out that Otani was number one on their list, so great job there, guys, at the MLB Network. Juan Soto, I mean, he, he's a really good player. He gets on base 40% of the time, but uh, what I felt concerning this year was a regression in his defense. Moving to right field in 2021, I think, did him a lot of good. That was a position he was most comfortable with in the minors, and yet this year, a step back, and I think it does raise some questions about his overall ceiling in the long term if he's not going to contribute as much on defense as we thought he was initially. I should point out that I believe Juan Soto was the only member of the Foolish 50 to be traded mid-season, and that's super relevant because he was my number two player coming into this season. It feels so goofy to nitpick a player this young who puts up a 400 on base percentage or better every season, even when, you know, the BABIP or the ground balls or whatever, the launch angle isn't fully calibrated, even when he's not hitting for as much power as he should be, he still gets on base like crazy. Seems crazy to nitpick a 149 OPS plus at his age, but I mean... StatCast outs above average, he had negative 10 in right field like that. That raises questions. That is that is concerning. And because that is integrated into Fangraph's war, he had 3.8 this year. That actually technically leaves him outside the top 50, which is just crazy to think about given how talented, how great Juan Soto is. I mean, I, I think he's an absolute superstar. Don't get me wrong. He will still be ranked highly, but I don't think he'll be ranked number two. I think I, I, think I overranked him this year. I even had one commenter who was expecting me to get really bold and rank Soto number one, and I considered it, of course. I considered it. I don't think there was a clear-cut number one going into this year. This person was disappointed. I must say, with the benefit of hindsight, I am not. I would have actually looked worse if I ranked Soto number one versus my actual number one. And that's because my number one was Mike Trout. Mike Trout, the greatest baseball player of a generation, giving him that benefit of the doubt, number one, had suffered some injuries coming into this year, also suffered an injury this year, so he once again did not put together a full season when he played. Was Mike Trout elite? Yes, he was. He was wonderful. He had a wonderful season when he played, but it's just tough with this guy, and you look at you know the progression of guys like Otani and now Judge, there's going to be some serious competition at that number one spot. 6 F4 in 119 games is really good. You know, if you extrapolated that into a full season, you're talking about easily a top five player in F4 again this year. 
plus three outs above average in center field. That's actually kind of encouraging. 178 OPS plus, that's one of the best hitting seasons in the league last year. I think maybe only Alvarez and Goldschmidt and Judge would have been ahead of him in that regard. So, you know, good season for Mike Trout when he played, but just given the direction he's trending and given the progress of guys, like I said, Otani, Judge, like those are the three guys that are competing for the number one spot next year. Who will it be? I can't say too much. I think Ryan Reed put it quite beautifully when he said, I'm not ready for a world in which Michael Nelson Trout isn't the undisputed best player on earth. And if that wasn't already the case going into the 2022 season, it's definitely the case going into 2023. I'm not saying he can't be the number one player. I'm not saying that at all, but he's definitely not undisputed. It is very disputable. So that was my reaction to my Foolish 50, but guess what? We aren't even close to done. We've got to talk about, you know, sort of our honorable mentions slash snubs. We want to celebrate the players who weren't on the Foolish 50, but absolutely had wonderful top 50 type of seasons. We also need to make some comparisons between myself and MLB Network, so let's go ahead and jump into that. So, going back to last spring, there were three players who didn't make the Foolish 50 that I really, 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 really wanted to find space for. These were the three that just so happened to be on the outside looking in. And of those three, Jose Altuve had by far the best season. He had a season that was actually top 10 by Fangraphs War. I felt like he could have been an MVP finalist this year, maybe taking Yordan's spot. He had a 160 OPS plus as a second baseman. Like, that is bananas. And if you think about all the second basemen I had ranked ahead of him, it makes me look real, real bad. Plus two outs above average, that's great. Jose Altuve, amazing year. will absolutely be back on the 50 next year. As you can imagine, in not including Altuve, I got plenty of feedback. Altuve not being on the list is crazy. Altuve needs to be on. Altuve disrespect. Shocked at Altuve snub. These guys were all proven right. I, I was wrong to leave Altuve off. I'll cop to that. Now, Altuve was actually not the bubble player that I got the most feedback on. That was actually Bo Bichette. And if you actually go back and watch the video, I anticipated that. Bo Bichette, he had a Bo Bichette type of season. High batting average. A lot of games, a lot of plate appearances. On base percentage, not the greatest just because he doesn't really walk. 127 OPS plus as a shortstop. That's wonderful, but minus 7 outs above average adds up to 4.5 F4. If you were to go by the strict F4 cutoff, he would be within the top 50, but with the caveat being, hey, this guy had so much more volume, more volume than almost anyone in the league. If you actually looked at it on more of a rate basis, he would probably be just outside the top 50. He's an interesting case. You know, he had a really rough start to the season, then I think really put it together in that second half. Will he be a top 50 player next year? I don't know. I think he'll be back on that bubble. Do I regret leaving him off this list? Based on this performance, I would have to say, no, I don't. And yeah, this was the type of feedback I was getting. Bo Bichette absolutely robbed. Look at this, 14 thumbs up on this comment. And I think looking back on it now, I wouldn't say he was absolutely robbed. I don't think he was definitively a top 50 player in MLB. But was he a bad player this year? No, no, not by any stretch of the imagination and a serious contender to be on the list going into 2023. The third player that I really, really wanted on this list, that I really, really wanted to find a spot for that I couldn't quite make happen was Giancarlo Stanton. And in this one, I actually turned out okay. I was actually kind of vindicated by leaving him off. 113 OPS plus. It's good. It's not John Carlos Stanton. He only played 110 games. And, you know, he's he's a DH a lot of the times. He's not the greatest outfielder even when he does play now these days with a negative two outs above average. So he's going to need to rake. You know, he's going to need to have a 140 OPS plus or higher, most likely, if he wants to be a perennial top 50 player in this league. 1.2 F4, just not quite getting it done. So I actually feel all right about leaving Stanton off. I feel kind of, eh, don't really care either way about leaving Bichette off, and I feel terrible about leaving off Altuve. Here's some of the feedback I was getting on Stanton, and look, I don't want to be in the position where it's just like, ha ha ha, like pointing and laughing at you all. I'm the guy that ranked Yasmani Grandal ahead of Nolan Arenado this year, so, you know, glass houses and all that. I can't help but laugh at how can you not put Stanton on the list but put Jordan Alvarez on it. They had on-paper identical seasons last year, and Stanton plays the field. That's why we project for the future, not the past. Another player I absolutely must talk about is Austin Riley. He actually was not a bubble player for me. I think if I'd actually built the list out further, he would have been closer to like 60th. This one was tough for me because I believed in the breakout. He was one of the five hitters I liked going into the 2021 season. I was completely vindicated. But then this year I was like, hold on, let me pump the brakes a little bit. I'm not sure about this guy's a top 50 player. And guess what? He absolutely was. In fact, for large stretches of the season, he looked like he was going to be a bona fide NL MVP candidate. 
kind of slipped, fell off at the end there. August, September, not the greatest for him. But look at these numbers, 142 OPS plus, 5.5 F4. Like, yep, this is a guy who will be on the Foolish 50 next year. And uh, I should have put him on this year. Got a good bit of Austin Riley feedback from you all. This is a case where you all can definitely point and laugh at me, say, ha ha, we were right, you were wrong. The most prophetic of these, not pathetic, but prophetic of these, comes from Sainaholic. He says, I can't believe you left Austin Riley off. It's okay, though. He'll force you to put him on here next year. And that's exactly what's happening. Julio Arias was a player I definitely considered for this list. You know, at a 2.16 ERA, which is excellent, but actually the FIP, you know, considering the fact he's like a fly ball pitcher, not actually the best, which adds up to not a top 50 season by F4. But then again, we're talking about an NL Cy Young finalist. I think Arias in this case is representing guys like, you know, there's a lot, there's Max Fried type guys out there. There's Aaron Nola type guys out there who I think had, you know, top 50 seasons, but were not ranked in my top 50. And I want to take this opportunity to recognize them. And here's some Julio Arias feedback. No, Arias is a crime. feel like Arias should be around 50. Arias, a big miss for me. He, he's a curious case. He's a curious case. I don't know if I can guarantee him a spot on the 50 next year, but he will definitely be up for consideration, as will Nola, Fareed, some of these American League guys, some of these guys like Dylan Cease, Alec Manoa. Like, there were some really good pitching performances this year. Justin Verlander, obviously. I mean, I really didn't consider Verlander for a spot just because there were so many questions coming off of Tommy John surgery in his age 39 season, and he absolutely delivered. He is your Cy Young winner for the American League with a 1.75 ERA in 175 innings. Will he be on the 50 next year? I will have to account for the fact that he is another year older. This will be his age 40 season, which is just insane to say. I'll also be curious to see where he actually ends up in his free agency, but you know, with the pitching, I think there is a lot of parity. It's really hard to say, you know, the difference between the fifth best and the 15th best pitcher. So when you're talking about a foolish 50 where I'm only going to rank 10 or 12, there are a lot of possible candidates and a lot of potential for snubbery. If we're talking about Cy Young winners, it was kind of a risky move on my part not to rank the 2021 AL Cy Young winner, Robbie Ray, on my Foolish 50, and in the end, this ended up working in my favor. A 3.71 ERA and 4.17 FIP and 189 innings. It's not like this is like just an awful, awful, absolute disaster of a season. It's not that, but he was closer to like an average pitcher than he was a top 50 player in Major League Baseball. So good move on my part not to include Robbie Ray, which you can't take for granted because this guy was coming off a Cy Young year. And here's some of that Robbie Ray feedback. What happened to Robbie Ray? What does a reigning Cy Young winner have to do? And it's just, you know, as good as he was, you have to look at some of those peripherals. You have to sort of project what's going to happen to him the following season. In this case, I left him off the 50, and it worked out for the most part. I think pretty much all my pitching picks, except for Walker Bueller, did better than Robbie Ray. Couple breakouts I want to talk about real quick. Dansby Swanson, Andres Jimenez, these guys had top 50 seasons, but they also didn't have a track record that would have had me seriously considering them for a top 50 spot. Then you got some of the young guys like Julio and Adley. Again, you know, they had great seasons, but I'm not kicking myself for leaving them off. If there's anyone I could kick myself for leaving off, it might be Jeff McNeil. Jeff McNeil had a great return to form. He was in my 2021 Foolish 50, but after a poor 2021 season by his standards, I left him off the list. Okay, I want to end things here with a little bit of a fun comparison between myself and the MLB Network list. You know, we could argue about places, but how about having placement at all? So what we're going to compare here is unique inclusions in my top 50 versus their top 50. So for example, here are all the players that were ranked in the Foolish 50 that were not in MLB Network's top 50. Grandal, Smith, Marte, Lau, Lindor, Alcantara, Alonzo, Crawford, Real Muto, Rendon, and Webb. And then you go to the uh, MLB Network list, and this is their unique list. Altuve, Anderson, Bichette, Riley, Castellanos, Marte, Mullins, Abreu, Ray, Freed, Rias. So as you can see, a real sort of mixed bag here. You know, some players here, it's like, oh my gosh, I had Yasmani Grandal at 28, and they had Jose Altuve. Like, I got blown out here. But then, you know, there are also some, some bad moves on their part, some good moves on mine. So what I went ahead and did is I actually assigned a win and a loss value to each of these players to try to determine where I stack up against MLB, just in terms of players we actually included in our top 50. So, for example, Yasmani Grandal was a huge L for me. Will Smith, I gave that actually kind of a neutral grade. I handed out a few of those. Cattell Marte, that's an L. He was not a top 50 player. Brandon Lau, I lost there. But I won with Lindor, Alcantara, Alonzo, Real Mudo, Webb. I did lose with Crawford and Rendon. And then over here, you know, 
Am I sad that Jose Altuve was not on my list? Yes, I took the L here. So this is all from my perspective. I took the L on Altuve. I took a dub on Tim Anderson, kind of neutral on Bo uh, L on Riley, dub on Castellanos, neutral on Marte. Uh, dub on Cedric Mullins, had a good year, but not a top 50 year. Kind of neutral on Jose Abreu and took a dub leaving off Robbie Ray. And then I actually gave L's for Max Reed and Julio Urias. I'm not sure if either of them had top 50 seasons. You could debate it either way. But they definitely had excellent seasons and they were NL Cy Young finalists. So I gave myself the L on both of those. The end result, believe it or not, is a 99 record with four sort of neutral grades. So look, in terms of our inclusions on the top 50, did I crush MLB Network? No, absolutely not. Did MLB Network crush me? No, absolutely not. You can look at it and say, oh my gosh, I had Grandal and they had Altuve. Oh my gosh, I'm such a doofus, you know, but I had Sandy Alcantara at 40. You know, at Sandy Alcantara at 40 and they had like, freaking, you know, Castellanos on their list. So either way, you know, there's some good here and some bad here. We're wrapping things up here. I do want to say, if you made it this far in the video, you're probably a pretty big Foolish Baseball fan, and I just want to give a shout-out to my Patreon. You know, if you want to support what I do monetarily in this offseason, when I'm not going to be getting a lot of attention because MLB is not going to be on, head on over to patreon.com Foolish Baseball. This isn't really so much a donation as it is an exchange. Here's what you get. You get access to an exclusive deleted episode of Baseball Bits. This was about the 2018 World Series. I deleted it because I didn't really like it that much. You get, you know, Patreon Q&As. I do a, a Q&A there about six times a year. I have hours and hours of Q&A footage to sort through all kinds of fun topics brought to me by the Patreon people, so you can participate in that. As you can see, I post my baseball bits on there. Uh, I also post sort of work in progress updates so people can see what I'm working on. Hey, guess what? I'm turning my attention to the yearly Foolish 50 reaction on Foolish Bailey. Guess what? I just did it. You can also get bonus video content like, here's six ridiculous Shohei Otani stats from 2022. Just me talking about Shohei Otani, what an excellent player he is, what an amazing 2022 he had. So there you go. Go on over to patreon.com slash foolishbaseball. You will all also get your name in the credits of a future episode of Baseball Bits. Thank you so much for watching this year and thank you for enjoying the Foolish 50.